All right, let's see. I'm going to pick on Catherine because we know this spot, this could never happen with Catherine. So Catherine has a real trouble doing her mastering homework. She does it every time. And so I've gone to Catherine. I, I've looked her in the eye. I said, why didn't you do your homework? She goes, oh, I forgot. So I'm like, okay, just maybe it's a one-time thing. Next week, she doesn't do her mastering homework. I'm like, Catherine, what happened? You, second week in a row, you haven't done your mastering. You have a zero. I forgot. Third time it happens, I call home. Mom says, I will talk with her. I assure you, it won't happen again. She doesn't do it. And eventually, I'm just going to say, you know what? Natural selection. Can't do anything about it. It is what it is. So that is kind of like just saying, I am going to go hands-free and let's just see where it takes us. In our human society, we have really tried to curtail uh, what we know of as natural selection as much as we could. When you guys are hungry, you don't have to go out fishing off Bay Shore and dive in the water or dig for a mole to eat. You go to PDQ and say, I want two spicy chicken sandwiches, please, thank you. When you're cold, because it's a really chilly night out, you don't have to go dig a hole in the ground or cover yourself in moss and lay with a bunch of other squirrels. You have this awesome place called a house. You have your own thing called a bed with a blanket and a pillow, maybe the heat on, it's a great thing. Well, imagine if you were a pelican off of Bayshore Boulevard on, in, tomorrow morning. When the sun rises, if you've ever been out there around sunrise, it is a feeding frenzy. There's dolphins, there's seagulls, there's pelicans, there's um, ospreys flying all over the place trying to get all the food. What if you're that pelican that can't get a fish? What is that going to mean for you? What is that going to mean for your babies? What if you are that squirrel on a really cold night that's not going to survive to morning because it just got too cold and you're kind of scrawny. You can't be really warm. What does that mean for you? These are all uh, concepts that really revolve around natural selection, which is what the topic of our discussion will be for today. Today is going to be an intro to natural selection. As far as your calendar is concerned, everyone, we are uh, perfectly on pace. In fact, I'm going to flip-flop or Tuesday and Wednesday's lesson. We're going to do Wednesday on Tuesday, and we're going to do Tuesday on Wednesday. That's really the only difference. But other than that, we are perfectly on track. So as to what natural selection really is, I'll get to that momentarily. But uh, I have an example. Have any of you ever had a staph infection? What was it like, Hartley? You're, you're a student athlete, by the way, so she, it's not surprising. Go ahead. What, I mean, what, what, what are your symptoms? What, what did it do to you? I had, like, a fever, and then it was just, like, a big, like, stab on my leg. Do you know how you got it, how you contracted it? Like, I think it was from, like, a lake or something. Oh, okay. So if you don't know, let me give you a little lesson here on what exactly staph infection is, and hopefully none of you will ever have it. Hardly, hopefully you'll, hopefully you'll never have it again. Staph is actually known as... Oops, staph, staph, uh, I spelled that wrong. Staphylococcus, real quick, what does coccus mean? You have that on your Latin. It means circular, the cells are circular. Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococci, uh, Staphylococcus aureus is an infectious bacteria. <clears throat> and because it is a bacteria, it is single celled. And by, and by the way, when I say bacteria, what type of cell is that? Prokaryotic or eukaryotic? You guys need to know that the words bacteria and prokaryotic are interchangeable. Most bacteria is good. Stuff like staph and strep and syphilis, they give it all bad names. <clears throat> it's um, single-celled, and if it, because it is a bacteria, it has a peptidoglycan cell 
wall. And some of the symptoms are, and I'm reading them from uh, my other computer here. You ready? Hartley, this might bring back some memories. Boils and oozing blisters. It can cause food, um, can also cause boost poisoning, resulting in nausea, vomiting, and stomach ache. It can turn, it can turn deadly if it gets deep into your tissues and enters your bloodstream. There have had people that have had staph infect their bones. It can cause fever, joint, and muscle pain. Uh, let's see, what are causes? See, how do you get it? She said she might have gotten it from a lake. So, uh, it's not very uncommon to have athletes get it because just, you know, sweat. Don't ever, ever, ever walk on a, a gym or locker room floor with your shoes off. Have sandals. It is just a breeding ground. And the hot tubs that are shared, like at LA Fitness on Del Mabry, you don't know what people have, and they're going in those hot tubs. It's a breeding ground for bacteria. So I wouldn't do it if I were you. Well, what do we typically treat? I'm sure Hartley had this when she had this infection. Um, do you know what the name of the medicine is that actually tries to kill bacteria? Anybody know? Sage? They're called antibiotics. Come to save today. An antibiotic is a treatment that kills uh, single-celled organisms. It kills bacteria. I mean, the words anti means against, and bio means life. These are things that are against life. They kill life. So I'm sure you were on antibiotics, right? Um, over the last, I would say, 70 years or so, doctors have been prescribing antibiotics, and there's many different types. We have hundreds of different types of antibiotics. Methicillin, ampicillin, penicillin. Um, there's a lot of various antibiotics that treat specific bacterial infections. And for the past 70 years or so, we've been using antibiotics to try to kill these bacteria. But because we've been doing that, we've, we as uh, humans here have been accelerating natural selection in favor of the bacteria. I mean, how can we be helping the bacteria if we're killing them? We're killing off the weak ones and allowing the strong ones to take over. So here's how this works. And let's get, and I'll, I'm gonna revisit this whole story later in my lecture. Today we're gonna to talk about natural selection. We'll come back to that story about the bacteria. If you want the textbook definition of natural selection, it's a process by which organisms <clears throat> better adapted to their environment survive and reproduce more offspring. Nature is not a consciousness. Nature is not a selector. It's, it is a plethora of factors that actually, um, I don't know, it, it selects or it instigates pressures on every species, animal, plant, fungus, bacteria you can think of, to um, actually be capable of surviving in a given environment. When I was a kid, I would always ask my dad, Dad, what would win in a fight? An alligator or a crocodile? Who would win in a fight? A Komodo dragon or a cobra? Who would win in a fight? Duncan or sage? You know, I would always say, well, who would win in a fight? A elephant or a rhino? Well, let me ask you guys, what would win in a fight? An American alligator or a polar bear? What would win? Yes, sage. It depends on the environment. That is what it's all about. Alligators are found in the swamp. Polar bears are found in the tundra and the icebergs. The glacier, or not the glaciers, but the icebergs. So when it comes to uh, natural selection, natural selection brings about evolution, which is very, very, very slow. And we're gonna talk about that more on Tuesday.
Evolution takes millions of years. Natural selection is predicated on the natural variations in every species. Okay, uh, Annie, are you a homo sapien? Are you a human? Okay, how many chromosomes do you have? You have 46. Uh, how many bones do you have, do you know? You have 206. You have 650 muscles, you have about 100 trillion cells. You know who else also has 46 chromosomes, 200, Six bones, 650 muscles, and about 100 trillion cells, 10 fingers, 10 toes. Serena Williams, the famous tennis player. You, ma'am, are no Serena Williams. I'm sorry to break it to you. She's one of a kind. But how is it that you're a human, she's a human, and she could just have so many more, in this case, athletic gifts than you? It's because of those natural variations. Natural variations. I'm a human. Hartley's a human. She's a state champ with cross country, if you didn't know. Put a little brag on you, right? Yeah, she didn't brag about it. She's modest. I'll brag for her. You, I'd go on Bayshore now and then. I'll jog a 5K here or there. Keeping up with Hartley? No way. Not happening. She has variations that work in her favor. Y'all ever heard of Michael Phelps, the Olympic swimmer? He has a naturally wider wingspan than a normal person. Like, here's my wingspan. His is just naturally longer. And so he is a much better swimmer because of the, those variations. Those variations work in his favor. What causes these variations? Despite the fact that you have the same species, in this case humans, but you have those little differences, those variations. What causes those variations? I'll give you a hint, X-Men, mutations. These variations are caused by mutations. All right, so when it comes to these variations, what nature does, and as I said, nature is a, a plethora of pressures, and I'll tell you what all those pressures are. Nature is actually going to select those pressures as being advantageous or not. And so the first example I would like to give on this topic is peppered moths in the Industrial Revolution in Europe. You've likely heard of this example when you were in freshman bio. If you don't, then if you never heard of it, then this will be all new. If you did hear about it, this is just gonna be a refresher. Well, in the early 1800s, the United Kingdom experienced an industrial revolution. Factories began to turn on coal burning plants. Well, let's talk about before that, pre-industry. In pre-industry, there were a type of moth. Well, just like in this room, we have redheads, we have blondes, we have brunettes, we have people with black hair. You're all humans. We have moths that have different phenotypes too. And so this first moth here is going to be called a peppered phenotype, where it's mostly a white moth with speckles of black. And then we have a moth over here that is just pretty much solid black. Now keep in mind, these are the same species. So the fact that they're the same species means a few things. But let's get this un understood. These are the same species. Because they're the same species, they can breed with each other. Uh, I am going to go out on a limb, Turner, and say that you are of European descent. Would I be uh, accurate in saying that? Where, where do you descend from then? Um, <clears throat> I'm 
I'm sorry? No. Your family, so you're Native American? No. Okay. Said, right. Go on, I'm listening. Didn't I, I said, are we all? All what? Are we all Europe? Yeah. No. We're all African. Where we came from. Yeah. We, all humans originated from Africa. They migrated through Europe on their way around the world. But as far as, I'm talking about ancestry. If I had you do a 23 me. What countries would come up? You don't know? Sage, how about you? Do you know what your ancestry is? I'm sorry? Hungary. Okay, so that's Eastern Europe. So you're of European descent, but you're still a human. Could you breed with an Eskimo? Could you breed with someone from Thailand? Why? You're all humans. Exactly. So despite the fact that these two moths may look different, that's just on the outward appearance. They're both the same species. Here in Florida, we have a species of snake called rat snakes. They come in red, yellow, orange, and uh, brown, but they're all the same species, so they can all breed with each other. They can pass on their genes to the next generation. And they have, there are varieties. They possess variety. Clearly, you have black and you have pepper. Okay, so where am I going with this? Well, before the Industrial Revolution, there are these trees. Here's a trunk of a tree right here. And these trees had just some patterns of, of black on them, but they're mostly white, almost like paper. Which moth would have a better advantage in blending it with its surroundings. Mackenzie, would it be the peppered moth or would it be the black moth in a tree trunk that looked like that? Exactly. So in this particular environment, the peppered moth was more advantageous than the black moth. It could not, or the black moths could not blend in. So you have the birds, The birds could easily see the black moths and eat them. And so it was not a good time to be a black moth. However, something happened. The power plants turned on. The coal burning um, furnaces turned on. And this produced a tremendous amount of soot and pollution. This was the early 1800s, early 19th century. So this caused a lot of that pollution to settle on the trees. And guess what, guys? The trees basically turned black. Mackenzie, what moth would be favored in this particular environment? That's right. So here's the peppered. The black moths would have a better advantage. What we would say is nature selected them. And I know that pollution is not exactly a natural phenomenon, but camouflaging from your predators is. Again, I know that pollution is not a natural phenomenon. I get that. But changing the environment in uh, camouflaging to avoid predators is a natural phenomenon. And the pepper moths can no longer camouflage from the birds and the birds could easily spot them. Now it's a great time to be a black moth. This is an example of natural selection. And the fact that the environment was changing is known as a selective pressure. Selective pressures are environmental influences. In which species must cope with to survive.
Here in Florida, we have selective pressures like uh, our climate for one. We have a very sporadic climate. It can be very hot. Um, some nights in this time of year can get very cold. We have hurricanes in the summer. We have thunderstorms every afternoon in the summertime. Um, during the spring, we might have uh, a cold front come through and spark up a tornado here and there. We might have a flood. We have a lot of various types of weather. So if you're a bird that can't produce and that can't build a nest that's actually stable enough to survive those winds from a hurricane or from an afternoon thunderstorm, your nest is going to fall over and everything inside of it. There goes your genes. There goes your lineage, possibly your, your survival. If you are a pelican that can't catch a fish tomorrow morning, all the other pelicans grab the fish that you're going for. You can't get a fish. That is... Um, nature would select against whatever is keeping you from getting that fish. Let's say that there was a nice shiny apple up here and all you need to eat an apple a day to survive, but the apple is up here on this top of this whiteboard. Duncan's going to be fine. He's nearly as tall as I am. He's going to be like, got it. And some of you shorter folks are going to go, uh, 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 can't get it. Nature would have selected against you in that particular environment you have unfavorable traits. So let's talk about what some of these pressures are. These are not only pre selected pressures, but these are also factors that drive evolution. Some of these are, and the biggest one is going to be competition. I'm gonna write that in all caps. Oops, spell that wrong. So competition is a really, really, really big issue. What are you competing for? Well, you can compete for food and water. You ever see two dogs at the dog park fighting over a toy? It can get pretty vicious. Fighting over a tennis ball. Uh, you can fight over mates. There's a reason why in the animal kingdom, most animals have antlers or horns or tusks are the males. Because typically they fight for the female. The female can reproduce. In order for the next generation to actually happen, you have to be able to reproduce and you need a female for that. Um, next one is going to be space and habitat. You need a place to sleep. You need a place to eat. You need a place to raise your family, raise your young. Competition is insane, insane. Animals, even plants, they compete all the time. Bacteria compete all the time. You guys compete all the time. When you graduate from college, your transcript is your resume. And when you go to get a job, you, have, you, you should have a better resume than your competition, which means you should have better grades in your competition. I've known people that got Bs in college and they took the class again so that they could get that A to have a better transcript. Another uh, factor is going to be the predator-prey dynamic. Predators, in, uh, being a predator or having a predator or being the prey is a huge driver in natural selection. With the moths, the birds actually seeing the moth was the major driver. That was the predator. Another one is gonna be climate and natural disasters. So there's many factors that actually drive evolution and drive natural selection. <clears throat> it's all about, do you have what it takes to survive in a given area? So this leads to something known as biological fitness. This is a foundational term that's gonna get you through the next several weeks, biological fitness. You've heard the expression or the bumper sticker, survival of the fittest. They weren't talking about the strongest or the fastest or the one with the best cholesterol in their blood. They're talking about the most biologically fit. And being biologically fit is a two part uh, concept. First, you must reach reproductive age. but it doesn't stop there. You must reach reproductive age and 
produced or produce viable fertile offspring. The fact that you are all here, living and breathing and surviving, suggests that your grandparents have good biological fitness, not your parents. Because your parents are your grandparents' children. And your grandparents were able to not only produce children, who are your parents, they were able to produce children who could have children. So the fact that you are all alive and doing fine, that looks good on the biological fitness of your grandparents. For you all to be defined as having great biological fitness, your grandchildren would actually have to be around and exist. That would be proof that your children could reproduce. So biological fitness is simply if you can make it to your reproductive age and produce fertile offspring. It also suggests that you have what it takes to survive. You have all the traits to survive in a given area. Okay. So another uh, example of natural selection, I want to go back to our example of the bacteria. And this is going to go to antibiotic resistant bacteria. So this is actually a huge deal. If you know anyone that's in the medical field, and you bring this up, they'll tell you it's a huge deal. This is a big problem. For the past 70 or 80 years since the invention of antibiotics, we've been using them to kill bacterial infections, strep, staph, you name it. Some bacteria are really, really tough to kill. Some bacteria are very easy to kill. Well, unfortunately, we, doctors were prescribing antibiotics for things that were not fixed by antibiotics. If you had the flu, here's an antibiotic. If you had a cold, a rhinovirus, here's an antibiotic. Well, a virus is not going to be affected whatsoever by an antibiotic. That's med school, that's pre-med school, that's high school stuff. A virus is not affected by an antibiotic because a virus is not living. An antibiotic kills living things like a bacteria. And so what you were doing is you were just, not, you were destroying all the weak bacteria and you were helping the ones that are more uh, advantage to survive. So let me explain this. Let me give you guys some visuals. Let's suppose that one of you has an infection from staph. You have Staphylococcus aureus. And you are going to be prescribed the antibiotic methicillin. Methicillin is an antibiotic that treats staph. So you use this, and I'm going to draw a bunch of little staph bacteria. There's the bacteria, there's one, there's one, here's one, here's one. Here we go. Every cell is a staph bacteria cell. Okay. Now, if you notice that there, I have a couple blue ones. I'll explain what those are momentarily. But I want to tell you exactly what these antibiotics do. So we have to go down, we have to zoom in on one of these. So what an antibiotic does is it can punch a hole or holes into the cell wall of a bacteria and kill it. So it's just kind of like this. It's drilling holes into the cell wall and it causes the, the bacteria to be vulnerable and its insides can leak out and you can fill it full of the antibiotic poisons and kill the cell. So we're going to use methicillin on this staph infection. Here we go. Killing a whole bunch of staff. Oops. All right, well, it looks like we got some, we got a good chunk. I have to go through it. Another round of methicillin treatment. Let's try to kill some more. All right, looks like we're getting close. Let's go to that third treatment. Here we go. Booyah. All right, we got them. Wait, what are those things? Why are they still there? 
These are mutants. If you give life enough time, it'll mutate. Even viruses are mutating. If you haven't heard of COVID, there's now a South African strain, a UK strain, a Brazilian strain, forms of the virus that have mutated. Before COVID was even a thing, I would tell my students, um, people that are anti-vaxxers and refuse to vaccinate, they can be troubling because you can possibly allow viruses that we have eradicated to come back like uh, measles and smallpox, polio, we've eradicated those. But if you don't vaccinate, they can make a return, which is no problem, we can, we can treat those but you are giving it the opportunity to mutate into something entirely new that we have never seen before. And then we're right back into the 1940s when it comes to coming up with the vaccine for some of these. So these are mutants and what you have effectively done, this is a very important part. You have eliminated their competition. Now, although they're all part of the same bacterial infection, every single cell is an individual organism and organisms compete with one another. If you see a herd of cattle in the field one day, they are competitors. They're fighting for eat grass. When you guys are at a big dinner, you, are, you better hope that whoever organized the dinner provided enough food for everybody, you're going to be fighting for some food. Or you might have that person say, hey, what the heck? I didn't get any pizza. What's going on? Who took all my pizza? You know, I took some. Yeah, what the heck? Why are you taking my food? You get a little heated. That's competition. So you have effectively removed the competition of these mutants. These mutants are now going to be able to replicate. You have what you've done by treating an antibi by using an antibiotic, and you did the right thing if you have a bacterial infection, but this is the consequence. Life is all about adapting. You have removed the competition and you have selected in favor of these bacteria by killing off the weak ones that were vulnerable to the antibiotic. And so now you're going to use methicillin. Methicillin doesn't work on this. This is a new strain of staph called MRSA. You ever heard of that? MRSA stands for methicillin resistant. Staphylococcus aureus. Yes, Annie. Um, do you think they have any that have like 90 yep. That's that point. Yep. That's what mine says right here. Hand sanitizers kills 99.99% of germs. Two things with that. One, if they send 100%, you still got a germ that can be sued. So they have to leave that little 0.0%. That 0.1% are the mutants that you can't kill. That's exactly why. So MRSA is like a super bug. We call it a super bug. It's a super staph infection. This has happened because of um, the overuse of antibiotics. You're basically killing off the weak ones and letting the super mutants uh, continue to survive. This has happened with gonorrhea, the STD. There is now super gonorrhea that our antibiotics have a lot of trouble trying to kill. So be very careful with your activities. Now let's say that the medical community is capable of creating an antibiotic strong enough to kill MRSA. MRSA is not easy to kill. It's very tough. It can be done, but it's very tough. Okay, so you, you'd come up with this very powerful treatment and you're killing off some of the bacteria. It might take a few, few doses, but over time, we're able to kill it. But let's say 20 years down the road, a new one shows up, even stronger than MRSA. Now you have a super duper bug. So between pathogens and uh, medicine, it's a constant tug of war. It's a race. Sometimes one person's gonna be ahead, then the bacteria gets ahead, then the medicine gets ahead, then the bacteria gets ahead. It's always back and forth, back and forth. It's always been that way, it's always gonna be that way. Okay, so let me tell you about these mutations. And we're getting close to being done. 
these mutations are not willed. You don't ask for it. These mutations are totally random. It is a known fact that lighter colored eyes uh, make people, makes it harder for people to see in very sunny, bright days, like in Florida. We've talked about that. If you have browner eyes, more than half of you have brown eyes, you probably don't have a whole lot of trouble seeing in, on a uh, sunny floor today. I can speak for the blue eyed people where it's tough sometimes. Um, I didn't ask for these. It's just, it is what it is. That's a natural variation. I didn't ask for not no wisdom teeth. That's just apparently a mutation in my family. Mutations are not, um, they are completely random. You're not going to will it to happen. I can't say I want to be tall and athletic and as good at basketball as LeBron James. <sighs> Come on, let's go. You can't do it. It's not going to work. So they're completely random. You can have various mutations. One type. A mutation can have no effect on your fitness. Um, as I told you guys, I was born without wisdom teeth. That's likely not going to affect my possibility of reproducing. You know, back in the 90s, they had these dating shows. I like someone who's really smart, really funny, uh, good looking, and um, likes that macaroni and cheese. No one would say, I like someone who has all their wisdom teeth. That's not going to really affect one's reproductive success. So some mutations are going to have zero effects. Hold on, Turner, I see you. Uh, number two, it can have a negative effect. If you have a mutation that results in a negative effect on your uh, fitness, this will result in no breeding you're probably gonna die. And you can't reproduce if you're dead. Maybe the mutation makes it easier for predators to find you. Maybe the mutation prevents you from finding food. What if some sort of species of frog develops a mutation where it grows a big horn on its head and the horn causes it to sink to the bottom of the pond? Okay, dead. And then lastly, you can have a positive effect. And this is going to result in adaptation, which will lead to reproductive success. Yes, Turner. No kidding. Now, is that going to affect, typically F4, is that going to affect your ability to find a wife one day? Probably not. So I would say that's a negative, or excuse me, a no effect on your fitness. It's not going to bother you. You know, get them all pulled out? That'd be fun. Did your dentist go, whoa? Well, good. All right. So <clears throat> I want to show you guys a few memes that I've seen over the years. That uh, you, These are on some of my evolution PowerPoints that I have uh, available for this unit. Let's see if I can get this. So I told you that in the human world, we try to curtail natural selection as much as possible. We try to tell that everyone is equal. Yes. Go ahead. Um, in our Bill of Rights for the United States, we say all men are created equal. And ladies, sorry, that's just how it's written. We now say men and women because just know the history of our country. Women once didn't have voting rights. That's in the past. But all men and women are created equal. That is, for, that is as far as your civil rights. You all have the same rights. That is not for your biological equality. You all are not equal. On a biological scale, you're not. Hartley can run further than any one of you, I bet. Um, Duncan just has the natural ability to dress cool. He, he loves it when I bring that up. Catherine is a great swimmer. Maybe she just has that natural gift. When you all have stuff you're good at, you all have things you're bad at. So biologically, you are not equal. Think about that. How is it that with sports, for example, I keep bringing up sports. Um, playing high school is, a, what, a five-time state champ? They have high school boys, 206 bones, 
46 chromosomes in every cell. How are they so much better than these other schools? Variations. Natural variations that are present in the population. Turner, get off your watch. Natural variations that are in all the populations. Some variations help you, some variations hurt you. So, let's see how I pull up with some of them here. Let's uh, share the screen. Natural selection means. You can also look up Darwin Awards. Those are fun. Here's one. No, oh, this really blew my mind when this happened. Can we all agree not to warn people about eating Tide Pods and let natural selection run its course? <laughs> I once saw this map showed Here's the, here's the rest of the world. I'm going to show the United States as a different color. If you live here, you live in a place where kids eat Tide Pods. It's crazy. Uh, let's see. There's one with a bunch of guys. Let's see. Uh, National selection, pool, plugs, theme. There it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's check this out. There we go. So there's a lot to dissect in this picture, okay? Got some guys having some beers over there in the little fill-up pool in the backyard. Looks like they have some sort of contraption on their table. And right here, we have a power strip floating on some sandals. And over here, we have the other power strip tied to a doorstop on the edge of the pool. Fun fact about water and electricity, it'll kill you. If one of these little plugs gets wet, it's gonna electrify the whole pool. So you know what, natural selection, it still works. I have, um, I have a couple of nieces and I was joking of course with my sister when my niece kept picking food off the ground and eating it. <laughs> and so my sister would be like, stop doing that. I would say, Jen, let nature take its course. It's natural selection. Sometimes you can't fight it. So as I was saying earlier, Catherine, do your homework. Oh, I forgot. Catherine, do your homework. Okay, I forgot again. After a while, I'm just going to say, you know what? I can't fight it. Nature is stronger. Natural selection. Uh, there's the haves and the have-nots. I know that's harsh, but that nature is not easygoing. We're so conditioned with the human world. Oh, here's a fun one. I don't know if you guys can see that. He's not going to make it. <laughs> um, <laughs> nature is harsh. And that's something you're going to learn very well in this unit uh, as far as adaptability, natural selection, evolution, uh, survivorship pressures. It's tough. All right. We are done for today. I think that was a pretty decent intro for natural